Welcome to Women in Electronics, the only show that empowers, develops, advocates, and celebrates the accomplishments and advancement of women in the electronics industry. With your host, Jackie Maddox. Okay, and welcome to another episode of Women in Electronics, and we are here with part two with Adam Norwood from Amphenol. And so, Adam, I just wanted to welcome you so much for being here. Well, thank thank you so much, Jackie. It's great to be back together with you, even if we are not in the same room, but it's wonderful to see you uh, here, here today. Well, appreciate you being here. And Really, before we hopped on today, we did have a little word about um, our recent um, news about Paul Andrews. And I just wanted to start on that note just to honor what's happening in our industry and son, an industry legend and a great that um, you knew well. So I want to turn it over with to that first before we start the interview to, you know, your sentiments with Paul Andrews. Well, Jackie, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, you know, when I heard about the passing of Paul Andrews, uh, which was just uh, this, I heard about that just early on Sunday this week, um, you know, my heart was just broken because Paul has been a close friend and I would say a mentor to me in all the years that I've had the just good fortune and grace to be able to spend time with him. Um, it, it's, it's a tragedy on so many levels to lose Paul and, you know, losing him within 24 hours of the 50th anniversary of the company that he founded, you know, in his garage. And, and it's amazing to think about a, a person of, of such just humility and grace and poise and drive that he started this just multi-billion dollar electronics distributor literally a, a one-man band um, on March March 1st of 1971 was when he started that company. And here, you know, to have his passing be within, you know, one, one turn of the calendar page of that day. Um, you know, my heart goes out to Paul's family, to his friends, which, you know, this is a person who has touched just thousands and thousands of people um, in the community of Fort Worth, where he was a lion of that community. I mean, born and raised, and, and lived and grew up, raised his family, raised his company all in Fort Worth, Texas. I mean, it, there's, it's hard to imagine somebody who's more connected to his place as is Paul, but, but most importantly to the team at TTI, you know, Mike Morton and Glenn Smith and, and all the others uh, that, that have really grown up under, under Paul's leadership. And, you know, you, you talk about leadership, you, you, you just cannot differentiate that ideal, the kind of platonic ideal of leadership from what was Paul Andrews. I mean, the most humble person that you ever meet, even with all what he has created, all the value that he created. And, and what always impressed me about Paul, especially in the later years of, of knowing Paul, you know, this is a person who made that very tough decision at one point. To, to take this company that he, he built with his own hands and his own brain and with his own team and, and to part with that as an owner. And he ultimately sold the company, as, as you know well, to Berkshire Hathaway many years ago. And the vast majority of individuals who make that decision you know, around the age where he did that, you know, which was in his mid sixties would have just, you know, gone off into the sunset and driven around on his boat to nice places and, you know, spent his money, so to speak. But that was not Paul. He continued all the way to, you know, his last days going to the office, running the company in the most active way possible, even though he was no longer the owner. And I think that is, that is an indication of a person who wasn't just in it for the money, who wasn't just in it for the power. He was in it because it's where his heart was. And, you know, I, I hear stories still to, uh, I've heard many stories of Paul, even, you know, with the greatness that he achieved, the value that he created, still going onto the computer and checking, you know, pricing and, and, you know, what was the inventory build of this part and that part. And, you know, he, he, he never tired of that, the details of the business, but most importantly, uh, of, of building that family at TTI, which is just such a wonderful company, a wonderful partner of ours over the vast majority of their 50 years. 
you know, we're proud to be a partner of TTI and, and I'm fortunate and proud to be able to say that I, I got to spend some time with Paul Andrews over those years. And, you know, when I was very young, when I was very young in the company, I remember first meeting Paul and he, he was just one of the most wonderful people. And so I, I'm, I'm really heartbroken with his loss. He's left us too early, but he's left a legacy that I think will go on for many generations to come. And, and we're proud to be a piece of that legacy. And, and I wish all of the team at TTI all the best as they, as they wrestle with the, the sorrows of, of losing their great leader. But fortunately, there's a lot of great people still in TTI, people like Mike and Glenn and all the others. And, and I'm sure that company is going to remain very, very strong for the future. It, with, with Paul's memory, giving them maybe a little extra, a little extra dose of, of passion uh, for their performance in the future. Well, I really appreciate that. And I think that what I take away from this whole experience, I never got to talk to Paul Andrews. I wish I had uh, more than anything. However, having said that, what it appears to me is that he built the people more than he built the business. And, you know, when you build the people, the people will build the business. Right. And so that is so amazing to me because there's not one person I've talked to that doesn't have just glowing things to say about Paul Andrews. And I think it's everything you care about in private that sustains and matters later. And you can't fake that, right? And so this is just a legitimate, authentic and real human being who had a massive impact on people that is sustainable and, and created a literally a lasting legacy. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And what's so special about Paul is he was who he was. Like, it's not that this was a different person at the office or a different person if you were having dinner with him, which I had the good fortune to do many times. He, he was just who he was, just the, this humble, caring, you know, passionate guy who, who knew how to run a business, by the way. I mean, this, this was a person who really knew where the, where the levers to pull were to make that business successful. And I think that's part of what kept him so close to the business later on. You know, he, he just loved to go into the computer and check things. And, you know, what, what's our inventory on that part? And I think that the guy could probably rattle off thousands of part numbers just off of his head. I mean, wow. This is why we're doing these interviews, Adam. I think I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, I am so appreciative that you're taking the time with how busy you are. And this is a part two, <laughs> because these are the things that matter and that other leaders need to hear. We're talking about those mentorship nuggets, the leadership nuggets, the things you learned from Paul. And we want to hear from you as well. Like, you received mentorship that you valued and that you will look back on and that will help you moving forward. And you are in a position to offer that mentorship to an industry of people who look to you. So this is a great segue into our next discussion about your leadership principles. Cause I know when we regrouped on a prior discussion, there's so many things you talked about that I just was so inspired by that. I would love for you to communicate um, with the people listening. So we'll all just turn it over um, to you to discuss your, your main leadership nuggets and principles that guides you in your leadership journey. Yeah, well, Jackie, that's, you know, that you put me in a tough position because I am, I by no means fancy myself an expert in leadership uh, whatsoever. I think that, you know, there, there, there's a lot of things you do when you, when you run an organization and an organization is really at the end of the day, just people. But, you know, I, I, I think there are a few traits that are important. I, I'd say they're important in all people, but they maybe become magnified in people who have really authority o over others inside an organization. Um, you know, I, I think the starting point is, is really compassion. I, look, Paul, what a, what a perfect example of, of someone who was so compassionate. Um, you know, compassion at the end of the day is putting yourself in the shoes of others and understanding you know, how, how they're feeling, what, what is important to them? What is, what, what, what are their joys and sorrows and what drives them, what motivates them? And that, that ability to separate from yourself and put yourself into the shoes of others, which is always not easy. Sometimes I, I will tell you, I, I, it's not always perfectly easy to, to detach yourself from the moment and to sort of 
understand and be empathetic to the position of others. Um, but, you know, great leaders like Paul, I think, have uh, do that just kind of as second nature, understanding that people have a lot of stuff going on. And look, this last year, if this has not been a wake up call for that aspect of that importance, you know, managing in a pandemic with all the challenges that, that so many have had, um, the, the dynamics that you, you, you struggle to even understand. Um, the, the physical health challenges, the mental health challenges that, that people have faced during the course of this pandemic. I mean, when, when do we in companies ever think about mental health? I mean, that's not a thing that you typically talk about at work. It's actually not a thing that people typically talk about, period. But I, I think this pandemic has really opened our eyes in Amphenol to the fact that we have a responsibility to, to understand and to, to care for both the physical health of our people. That was the top priority with, with the pandemic, making sure that our people remain safe, but also the mental health. And, and this, you know, this pandemic has been uh, as much of a mental health crisis as it has been a physical health crisis. And I think a compassionate leader thinks on all those angles about the, the people that he or she is, is really charged with. Um, so that, that I think is number one, the, the, the starting point for all of these things is, is I believe that, that sense of, of compassion for others. There's another piece of, of just being in a company and ultimately being a leader in a company. And, and again, I, I can't help but go back to Paul, which is this just extraordinary and insatiable sense of curiosity. And, you know, again, here's a guy, 77 years old, he doesn't need to work, obviously, he sold his company to Berkshire Hathaway, yet, yet he still wants to noodle around and see the new product and see what that new application is and, and this kind of thing. I mean, just always being curious about just almost anything. And I think curiosity is sometimes a hard thing to fake. Like you kind of are or you are not. I mean, I, I actually just finished reading the biography, this wonderful biography of, of uh, Da Vinci. And that's like the main thing about Da Vinci, like the, that, that he just, there was not one thing that he didn't want to learn more about. And, and I think that's kind of cool. Like the, life is like filled with wonder if you just let yourself be aware of it and dig into it. Like, how things work is so cool. And like being in the electronics industry, like we get to see sort of the nuts and bolts of how things work. And that's just so cool. And I think if, if you're curious about things, it, it drives you to explore more. It drives you to ask more questions. You, you show a genuine interest in what people are doing. And again, you're not faking it. You actually are interested in it. I think that that helps people feel really good about it. It helps you find things out, which is important as a, as a leader, but it also, I think people feel that uh, you really care about what they're doing because it's cool. A lot of the stuff we do is like really cool. You know, we, we make connectors to my family and to outsiders. They're kind of, you know, boring little things here, but to us, these are like extraordinary yes. components that, without which, you know, ventilators don't work and the internet doesn't work and airplanes can't fly and trains can't go. And, you know, you can't have solar energy without them and all these other things. And, and when you really get into how they work, like the real nuts and bolts of how they work, it's, it's just extraordinary. And, and I think finding the, the joy and the wonder in, in all those things is, is I think a really important uh, really important. You know, I didn't set out to, to go run a connector company. I honestly, when I got my internship with Amphenol, I didn't know what a connector was, but, but I just started asking lots of questions and it, and it just turned out, it's just really cool. And, and there's so many just layers and layers of things that you can uncover and discover. And it's like an unending journey. And I think, again, you know, Paul is 77 years old, could have retired a decade ago but that unending journey of discovery was part of what I think kept him, him going. And it's certainly for me, part of what keeps, keeps me going. I love that. I think one time we talked and you said, be the jack of all trades and the master at none. I love that. I love that mentality. I, I really think it does um, inspire people to keep learning and growing. Um, so anyway, with yeah. that, any other 
nuggets on your list of principles? Look, the, the last thing, and these all sort of, by coincidence, start with the letter C. I don't know why. Um, but look, being a leader is a lot about just talking and listening, which is communicating. Um, and, you know, when my, my kids over the years asked me, what do I do at work? I basically say, I read things, I hear things, and I talk about things. And that's kind of my job. And that's it. I mean, you're either reading, talking, or listening. Like, that's basically 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it, it's, it, it takes, I, I think, a real focus on all of those fronts, you know, knowing what you need to digest, what information do you need to get, but also you know, listening to people in a very uh, attentive and, and aggressive fashion. And a great leader, there is a lot of kind of selling that you're doing all the time. You're selling to customers, you're selling to potential acquisitions, you're selling to your employees, you're creating kind of a, some sort of a, a, a path forward for them, whether you call it a vision or whatever. I mean, I'm not so high, high minded about that, but, but it, you're, you're always trying to give people through your words, you know, that, that kind of next dose, if you will, of, of nitro into the engine to, to keep going. And I think, that ability to communicate is, is a really critical thing for, for all leaders. And you know, it's trite to say it. I think I'm not so innovative to come up with that idea, but, but I think it is a, an extraordinarily important building block. You know, it doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't, doesn't matter you know, what, what background you come from, but I, I think the ability to, to carry a message to people and to hear a message and information back from people is, is a really unique and, and critical ability. For well, I think that's really important. As you said, it's something we hear about, but it's not so easy to do. <laughs> communication is, you know, there's, there's degrees in communication, right? It's very mm -hmm. complex, it's not easy. So if you have a leader who truly does this, this will lead me into this next question because we were talking previously too, and you had said, let others do their jobs. Like one person cannot run the organization. Well, that is really hard because you have leaders say like Paul Andrews that were very involved, but yet was able to let his leaders lead. That is really tricky. How, what are your comments on that? I think I struggle with that a little bit as well myself, because I am so involved, but how do you let others lead and really um, let go a little bit as a leader. I mean, look, Paul is again, uh, just can't stop but come back to him. He was extraordinary at this, you know, giving people the freedom and the authority to, to do what they needed to do while still staying involved and, and aware of, of what's going on. You know, at the end of the day, you know, what, what makes our company Amphenol so unique is that letting go of seeding authority and seeding responsibility to people in the organization who have really comprehensive accountability, that's, that's basically our structure. I mean, it's an entrepreneurial culture where we have around the world 125 general managers. And these are women and men all over the world who have the total responsibility to run their companies on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and we, we talk to them and we communicate with them but ultimately they're making every day the dozens, if not hundreds of little decisions and sometimes some decent sized decisions that, that are determining the, the short, medium and long-term success or failure of their businesses. And it's our job to be there for them, to be supportive for them. And you know, we, we have these 125 general managers, they're organized into seven operating groups and those group executives then, then report to me and, you know, whether it's those group executives or, or me and my very small headquarters team, uh, our job is to enable those 125 general managers to support them, give them resources, challenge them, of course, with, with you know, kind of bold, bold targets and visions um, and, and moderate if there's any issues between them and step in when we can be of, of, of help, but, but step out when we would be hurtful to the business. And, and the, the, the knowledge of when to step aside and let them just do their thing, which is kind of our default position, that, that's really important. And you know, how do you have the confidence to, to do that? In our structure, in, our, in, in the culture of Amphenol, it's about having people who are just phenomenal entrepreneurs and knowing that, that again, these, these women and men around the world, they, they know what they're doing. And while they may make 
the mistake once in a while, you know, those mistakes are, are things that you can learn from. And we try to make it such that if you do make a mistake, and I made a bunch of them when I was a general manager, you, these are not sort of bet the company kind of mistakes that we can deal with it if, if, if something goes wrong. And actually you learn more from those mistakes that, that are you know, oftentimes small things that we could have done differently. That's where the real learning and the forging of the leadership capability of those individuals is. And by, by giving people that, comprehensive responsibility pretty early in their career, we really create in our company, at least a forging of, of these leaders, which ultimately become, you know, of, of greater and greater responsibility later on and become the real uh, leaders of, of the organization. And, you know, I had the good fortune myself to go through that same gauntlet. I was a you know, 30 years old general manager of a you know, 20, $25 million business. And, my God, I, I messed up a lot of stuff. I made a lot of bad decisions, but I, each one of them is, is kind of etched in my mind like it were on a tablet. Mm. And I, I never forget them. Still today, there's rarely a day goes by where I don't reflect back on something I kind of messed up you know, 20 years ago and the lessons that came from that and how that informs, you know, hopefully a little bit those mistakes as the CEO of the company today. Well, I think that obviously you have gained um, a lot of wisdom and knowledge from those um, experiences because here you are now. And it, it makes me reflect on Warren Buffett said something about failure. And I think leading into the next question about women, we tend to really worry about failure <laughs> and not really want to fail um, it, it, on a very deep level. And Warren Buffett's Failure is just another way of doing things. It's just learning another way of doing things, which I love. So, you know, on that note, what are your nuggets of input to women in the industry? How do you feel about women and where we are right now? What we faced since this pandemic, what our opportunities are, um, what are your insights on women in their leadership journeys? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I mean, for the industry, I think we have a long ways to go to to have you know, kind of whether you want to strive for parity or, 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 or whatever proportion of women in leadership positions. I think the industry has a long ways to go. I think we recognize that we have, you know, still a journey to travel um, on this. But, at the, you know, when I when I talk to the women in our company and, and I see just the great success uh, that, that they've had, I don't think that there is, you know, a, a different approach that one should take based on uh, one's gender. But I think as a company, you need to create, first and foremost, an environment where women feel not just, you know, comfortable, but, but welcomed into that environment. And I think, you know, that if you go back in time, you know, to sort of the kind of madman era of, of companies, you know, that's sort of the poster child of not being welcoming. You know, what does welcoming mean? It doesn't mean, you know, coddling people or anything like that. It, it means that this is a place where actually gender doesn't matter. Like all that matters is performance and success and opportunities. And we're willing to take risks on people. You know, I had risks taken on me as a young person who probably was not appropriately experienced to become at the time a general manager. And, you know, you could argue I probably wasn't appropriately experienced to become a CEO when I was, uh, you know, when I became a CEO in, in, in 2009, January 1st, I think it was. Um, and, and we should, as a company, take risks on people, men and women. And I think that's, that's really important that sometimes you, people should be promoted to levels where they might make mistakes and, and there should be a tolerance for that. And, and there should be, uh, again, for men and women, but I think in, in particular for women, because women are underrepresented in the electronics industry, they are underrepresented in our company. Um, you know, even if more than half of our employees worldwide are women, um, that's in part because we operate in some countries where women tend to work in, in manufacturing. Um, I think it's about 27% of our leadership team is women. And that's sort of on par with the industry, but it, there's no reason that shouldn't be 50%. I mean, women represent half of the world. Why should you not be accessing half of the world for your talent? I mean, that, that's the basic thing when you're running a company, like you should not close yourself off 
to half of the world's talented individuals to, to be part of your organization. And, and so for us, it's really important that we make progress and strides so that that 27% becomes a third and that the third becomes 40%. And, you know, one day, you know, I'm very optimistic and hopeful that this, that, that there should be parity in the electronics industry and, and, and inside of Amphenol. And so I think that, you know, creating opportunities for people, maybe when they're not even on paper, ready like I had for me. And, and I look across my organization, a, a lot of our you know, strongest leaders, there was a moment in their career where they weren't ready for the next job and they still got it. And, and I think that's, that's really, and, and maybe doubly important for women. I think you, know, you, you mentioned the word mentor and there's no doubt, you know, I've been fortunate my, my whole career, even before I was at Amphenol to always have somebody who I could call a mentor, they may not have been formally a mentor. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's not always that that person is kind of assigned on paper as your mentor, but, but for whatever reason, you, you click with that person and, and you learn from that person. And actually, I was, I was talking to someone earlier today about one of the great challenges of the pandemic is a lot of what you learn from a mentor is in the unstructured interaction with that person. You know, even, even just work habits, you know, when I was 22 years old and I sat, I had the good fortune to sit outside the office of this, this more senior lawyer and I just used to watch him. And it's not like he was sitting me down and saying, here are the three things you need to do in life. I just watched him do things like how does he conduct himself on a phone? You know, how does he interact in a stressful situation? And you know, what are his work habits? And I adopted those. And actually still today, some of my work habits come from that 22 year old sitting outside wow. the, the office of, of this gentleman named Ernie Meyerfeld was his name. And, and I think it's important as a company that we're ensuring that, that all of our young employees, but especially women have access to mentors who, who can help them as they develop as individuals. I, I was very lucky in Amphenol. I worked for a number of different people, each of whom I learned something different from. And still today, I have people in the company who I consider mentors, even if you know on the org chart, I might be above them. I consider them true mentors to me and I'm continuing to learn from them. And I think that, you know, I, my advice to, to any women who, who really want to make a career in the electronics industry and in our company is, is find mentors for yourself in a way that may not be obvious. It might not just be the person in the block on the org chart above you. There can, it can be someone below you. It can be someone in a totally different business. It can be someone in a totally different company, but there's so much to learn from the extraordinary variety of how people work, how people comport themselves, how, how they approach challenges and opportunities. And you, you cannot do that on your own. It's what I worry about with the pandemic and people working remotely, you lose that unstructured mentorship. And so we as a company are trying to find ways to, to, to not make it rigid and structured, but to create you know, more opportunities for people still to interact and, and, and to, to have that kind of apprenticeship and learning that, that is so important to success. Adam, that is just amazing <laughs> advice that you just gave. And I, I think what you're talking about is modeling. One of the things that I'll just throw out here for women, I think one of the challenges we've faced, although we have amazing leaders in place, we are in just the best position we could be in this industry with all the leaders like yourself, opening the doors for women and having these conversations but I think as a woman, when you are a professional and you're, say, having a family, watching another woman who's navigating that or who has done that successfully is critical. Women to have other women to look to for women's issues in the workplace. And when you don't have enough to aspire to or to watch, <laughs> sometimes it could be detrimental. And so I think that's part of why the parity is important because there's a lot of issues that women face that are specific to women that another male leader cannot necessarily help them with. Um, so these conversations are so important because it's bringing to light um, an industry 
um, you know, all of our the, the issues we face because our issues become our male leaders' issues because they need the talent as well. So I love that we're having these discussions and I'll just end on a final question. I know we're a little bit running over time, but I really wish <laughs> we had a lot more time, Adam. Um, but I've really contemplated this quite a bit, this next question that I have for you. It's substance over success. And I'll tell you, we keep coming back to Paul Andrews, but I put it out there on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago is, are you striving for substance or success? And I just don't know that people think about that enough. And if I look at somebody like Paul Andrews, I don't know that he was waking up every day saying, I want to be successful. I think he was maybe striving to be a person of impact and, and, and substance and, and bring value and meaning to his people and make a difference. That, that's what it appears to me. But I'll just turn that over to you to comment. Yeah, I think, look, Paul is a perfect example. Why did he work for nearly a dozen years after selling his company to Warren Buffett and still come every day into the office and work a full-time job? It, it was not for you know success in the way that it is traditionally measured let's put it that way you know financial success or something like that he, he did it because of the satisfaction i mean you use the word substance i i think substance is a great concept but i i would make it even more simple which is just we do this for satisfaction because you you work is is not called play it's called work <laughs> But at the same time, there is a sense of, of true satisfaction that one can get when you're part of an organization that you love, when you're in a, a company that's doing something that you find exciting and intriguing and important and substantive, um, where you feel you have impact. And at the end of the day, if you get compensated one way or another from that, that's, that's kind of gravy. But the, the real feeling is the, the sense of satisfaction and accomplishment of having really made an impact. And, and I think that's what keeps, I think, so many like Paul coming back every day to the office. It, it wasn't because he, he needed that next paycheck to, to put food on the table. By the way, there are a lot of people who do need that. And we have a lot of employees who do need that next paycheck to put food on the table. And you know, I can tell you, I've been in that position myself for, for many, many years. I'm fortunate not to be today, but, but you know, we shouldn't lose sight of that, that there are a lot of people for whom a job is a job and it's, it's serving a purpose to, to feed one's family and to create you know, a financial stability. But if you can do that while also getting a sense of satisfaction that you're really impacting something, a community, a group of people, uh, an industry, the world. I mean, that, that's a pretty good feeling. I mean, I, I tell you, this, this last year, I think, has, has been a reckoning for all of us as we think about truly what matters. You know, when, when you face an existential crisis like a pandemic, and when you, you know, are sitting also in a world where there's other existential crises that, that are in front of us, the climate, for example, is, is one obvious one. You, you approach what you're doing, I think, with a different sense of purpose when you get woken up to, to the reality of, of working in a pandemic, for example. I mean, I, I'm, I, I can't tell you, you know, just how proud I am of, of the passion with which our team approach protecting our fellow employees with the passion that we approached enabling customers to participate in the fight against the pandemic, you know, components onto ventilators, components into, into the internet to allow, you know, Zoom meetings like we're doing here today, um, you know, protecting the, the temperature of vaccines, which we're involved in, by the way. I mean, I can't tell you how proud I am that we're playing, you know, our small part in helping the world face this, this once hopefully in a lifetime pandemic. And, and that has nothing to do with a paycheck. That's all about a purpose and, and the substance and the satisfaction that comes from that. And, and I think that more and more uh, people are going to gravitate to that. And you know, we're really excited in Amphenol that, that people can have great careers, men and women of, of all types around the world 
that, that can create for them their own value and, and financial stability, but it, moreover, it can create for them an intellectual and an emotional satisfaction, the value of which I think is far beyond any paycheck. Wow. Well, I was going to ask you about your competitive advantage of Amphenol in the marketplace, but you just answered it <laughs> right there so perfectly. And on that note, um, unfortunately, uh, we're probably way over time, and I'm so sorry. I'm sure. No problem, Jackie. It's a pleasure. <laughs> and- it was fabulous and wonderful and a treat talking to you today. And I really greatly appreciate your time and love your leadership, love Amphenol, uh, appreciate your sponsorship and support of women in electronics. So thank you so much for being with us, Adam. Well- Jackie, thank you. And thank you for your leadership of this very important organization. Um, and, and I wish you and, and your family all good health. And hopefully, you know, we're all getting vaccinated soon and we can start to get back into a normal world. And, and you know, I just want to finish on wishing the team at TTI all the best uh, and Paul's family and friends and his colleagues as they go through this, no doubt, difficult time period. And I'm sure they have friends across your, your universe, and, and certainly we all carry them in our hearts. Awesome sentiment to end on. We send our thoughts and prayers out to the family as well, and the friends, the colleagues, and the industry that literally this is one of those times everyone just cries together. Uh, there's certain times in life you just do that, right? So on that note, thank you for being here, and I uh, look forward to seeing you another time in person. <laughs> thank you so much. Great. Bye-bye. You've been listening to another episode of Women in Electronics right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net.